there. It's Gary Parrish. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting dodo birds and leaky black. The Eye on College Basketball Podcast is presented by FanDuel Sportsbook. Make every moment more. Matt Norlander is here with me. If you're watching on YouTube, smash the like button like your Brandon Davies. You have consent, and don't forget to also subscribe to the CBS Sports College Basketball YouTube channel. While you're here, let's get into it. We will eventually get to tonight's biggest game, which is number four, UConn, at number five, Kansas. And I'll definitely get Norlander's thoughts on his first trip to Bud Walton Arena, where Arkansas upset Duke a couple of nights ago. But I want to start with some news connected to a couple of high-profile college freshmen. One of them is Bronny James, the other Mikey Williams. Let's start with Bronny James. He's been medically cleared, Norlander, to yep. resume basketball activities, which is obviously great news for LeBron, for Bronny, and the entire family. This, of course, comes after he, earlier this calendar year, suffered a cardiac arrest. How big of a deal is this for USC? It's obviously great for, for Bronny and, and the family. Okay, so uh, it's 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 very good. The timing isn't surprising. Um because Bra LeBron previously said that Bronny had his last major testing and checkup this he had to go through at the end of November. Uh, so I was anticipating this would happen at some at some point at the end of this week or the, or the start of next week, we would at least hopefully get an update. And thankfully, we did get an update. Bronny had actually gone through pregame warm up stuff, uh, just general like layup line stuff, nothing major with USC, which was another strong indication that we were uh, we were headed the right way. Um, the question is, how soon will he play? Uh, it, it, it will be as soon as 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 he is comfortable and the, and the coaching staff is comfortable with allowing that to happen. Uh, but as coincidence would have it, we actually have recent precedence with this situation. Uh, obviously, Vince Iwuchukwu, the USC big man who's still on the roster, uh, his exact uh, ailments were not uh, identical to Bronny James, but he did get sidelined because of a heart failure and missed last uh, part of last season when he was determined uh, or publicly announced to be cleared and good to go. Uh, it was all but a few days between that and his actual debut in a USC uniform. Um, so uh, it, it, I, there's a possibility that this could actually be really, really quick. I mean, he's been cleared to go, and it's just a matter of if the conditioning is there and when he can uh, and when Bronny James can participate. Now, this, the the game that he winds up actually doing it, um, the calculus will change a little bit for USC in terms of the Trojans have received plenty of of pub. Uh, they've been a little bit of a letdown so far this season. They're five and two, not a huge one, but just a little one. You know, they dropped the home game to Irvine a few weeks back, and then they couldn't pull out a tight one uh, over Thanksgiving weekend against Oklahoma in that MTE. They play, and we'll get this later in the show. They play on Saturday against Gonzaga, and that game was organized in no small part because it's in Vegas. I mean, it's, it's, it was supposed to be Bronny James on a good USC team going up against Gonzaga two projected, you know, extremely relevant West coast powers for this 23, 24 season. Um, I guess we'll wait and see after this, there's an eight day break for USC. It's next game because of finals uh, doesn't happen until Sunday, December 10th against long beach state. And then there's another week after that, that they'll, uh, that they'll wait until they play at Auburn. So, um, I'm I'm not a doctor. Obviously, Parrish is. I'll leave that I to him. Uh, in in light of this announcement and seeing what happened with Iwuchuku last last season, but literally earlier this year, that happened in January. Um, I mean, if he's good to go, I'm 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 hoping to see him against Gonzaga GP. But I, it's a quick it's a quick turnaround. I just don't know the conditioning. Uh, you would think that maybe Long Beach State might be uh, might be as long as we have to wait. But it is LeBron James's son. Uh, different factors altogether. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts and uh, and expectations here moving forward? I, I don't think he even tries to play against Gonzaga. My understanding is that uh, he'll watch this weekend. Mm -hmm. And then I would think they'll lose, uh, use that pretty lengthy uh, stretch of days between the Gonzaga game and the Long Beach State game uh, to ramp up. And then I, I, I guess I would expect to see him then on, on December 10th uh, at home against... Long Beach State, and looking at the Lakers' schedule, they would be off that day, and that's notable because LeBron James has said if Bronny's first game is on the same day as a Lakers game, he will skip the Lakers game to watch his son's first game 
at USC in person, which I guess is kind of a minor, minor controversy. How do you feel about that? LeBron James skipping a game to go watch his son play basketball. Lakers are going to survive. I actually love the move. Um, LeBron haters are going to be out in full force uh, claiming it's a, it's a look at me move. Whatever, man. Your son's about to make his college debut and he collapsed and had to be rushed to the hospital because of a heart issue earlier this summer. Doctors say he's good to go. LeBron James can miss three straight weeks of, of Lakers games to watch Bronny play for all I care. So um, I look forward to seeing uh, him on the sideline whenever that winds up being. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I think a, a different version of me, a younger version of me, uh, would have probably been like, you're paid to play basketball. You should go play basketball. All 82 count. This could cost you in the standings. Blah, blah, blah. As a father, um, I find it difficult to criticize somebody for trying to be a good father. I'm just not going to, you know? Like, uh, I, I I, think LeBron's quote was family over everything. And I, I um, you know, I, I don't. I just find it I find it hard to argue with somebody who says, you know what, I I just want to be there for my son. Like I, I I'm not gonna question that. Um you you run into these sometimes in sports uh where a f- expected father will miss a game because they want to be there for the birth of their child. And that that'll turn into a thing on talk radio where people are like, should you really? And it's like, yo, like, what are we arguing about? Somebody's trying to do the, what, what most of us would consider to be the right thing. Somebody's trying to do it. And now they're getting criticized for it. So yeah, if LeBron wants to be there for Bronny's first game, whenever that is uh, fine with me, Uh, you touched on USC as a slight disappointment five and two right now uh opened with that nice victory over Kansas State but Kansas State is now outside of the top 40 at Ken Palm so USC still has zero top 40 Ken Palm wins with losses to Oklahoma and UC Irvine they started 21st at Ken Palm now down to 31st 33rd at Torvik as of this moment if you remove preseason bias so um yeah a slight disappointment nothing alarming there um but but you know, they have played the first seven games and presumably will play the first eight at least without not their most heralded freshman. That's Isaiah Collier, but one of their most heralded freshmen. And that would have been Bronny James. I, I guess my question is, I I don't doubt that he'll help eventually. I am skeptical that he'll help immediately because my experience um, in this sport is, is when freshmen, unless they're just unbelievably physically overwhelming talented like you could drop them in at any point and they'd be ready to go when you miss this much time you it, it becomes difficult to catch up um it, it doesn't mean that he won't play an important role at some point but he's missed a significant amount of time of not just conditioning but like actual practice stuff that is very important for first year college basketball players and that's why i i would imagine it'll be a a slow build to whatever, wherever this is going, Andy Enfield and that staff, they're going to have to build toward toward it over several weeks and maybe even, you know, a month or so. Yeah. I will, we'll have to see how that is. I mean, it's, this is now that he's been cleared, it's developed into a, a, a wait and see story and one of intrigue in terms of when he debuts and then how impactful and effective he is. The minutes he plays, I'll just remind our viewers and our listeners that Bronny James, uh, was expected to be, uh, I think, the absolute best case scenario for Bronny James going into the season, even if he had never had the heart issue, was that he would be the third best player on the roster, uh, clearly behind Isaiah Collier and Boogie Ellis. But in reality, um, when you look at how valuable Kobe Johnson is as a two way player, uh, DJ Robin has had some good moments there. And even if, you know, between Josh Morgan and Vinci Wuchuku, like uh, Bronny James just might wind up being, um, uh, you know, a key piece as a role player. And there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever, but just keep that in mind. Yes, we're leaving the show with it on a Friday going into the weekend because the news did come out on Thursday night and this will be a highly anticipated debut. But uh, if he can step in and and do a lot of the little things right, he can be the guy, he can be a piece, I, I frankly believe this, that, uh, that can help USC to top two status in the Pac-12 um, right behind Arizona, but we'll but we'll wait and see on it. And uh, just glad that he's been able to be cleared and and returning and playing college basketball. Three months ago, 
uh, two months ago, that was very, very much in question. And now uh, it's tremendous to see that the family released a statement and he is uh, he is good to go and can't wait to see whenever his debut is. So that was one big story connected to a high profile freshman. We did get another one on Thursday because Mikey Williams uh, reached a plea agreement in his felony gun case. The Herald of Prospect pleaded guilty to one count of making criminal threats after previously being charged with nine felonies. According to the agreement that's been reached with the San Diego County District Attorney's Office, uh, Mikey Williams is going to have to attend uh, behavioral therapy, uh, gun safety classes, anger management classes, and complete 80 hours of community service. And if he does all of that uh, before his sentencing date, which is now set for August 12th, 2024, um, this felony charge will be reduced to a misdemeanor, meaning Mikey Williams could avoid being a convicted felon and everything that goes hand in hand with that, as long as he spends the next nine months doing what he's been told to do. So now what? Obviously, he is signed and actually enrolled as a student at the University of Memphis right now, taking online classes from California. The question people are asking around the Memphis program is, does this clear Mikey Williams to play for the Tigers this season? or next season, or ever. How do you think Memphis should handle this? Well, that, this is, when you consider all the facts of the case uh, as they stand right now, but also what you've previously harped on plenty, GP. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think Memphis should not disregard uh, what did still happen the, the the most important action of all and that is firing a gun into a car filled with people and not give uh not not play it so lightly um i still think that you know mikey williams isn't uh draped in glory here uh even if the case for him personally is heading toward a resolution here that is a lot better than it looked for a long long time uh, you were someone that said that you wouldn't have Williams ever play for Memphis. Uh, is that where you're still at as of this moment? And obviously, this is going to be something that you dive into heavy on your, I would think, on your show uh, in Memphis later on today. Um, where do you stand now that we have this latest update? I am happy, I guess, for Mikey Williams in the sense that um, anytime you are charged with nine felonies and you can reach an agreement that will possibly leave you eventually with zero felonies on your record and no jail time. Um, that's a good, that's a good development for you. Uh, so I, I good for Mikey Williams, I guess it doesn't change the fact that he has been credibly accused of firing a gun into a car filled with six people and the bullet hit the car. It only didn't hit somebody because he got lucky it only didn't kill somebody because he got lucky. And the testimony is that there was a disagreement slash altercation slash incident inside the home. These people then went outside the home. Mikey Williams had told them at some point, according to the testimony, you better get to stepping or you'll leave with bullet holes. And then, according to the testimony, as the car was driving away, it was struck by a bullet that multiple witnesses have said uh, came from a gun that Mikey Williams shot. Simply put, I don't think any self-respecting university should have somebody who has been credibly accused of firing a gun into a car filled with six people. Um, I don't think any self-respecting university should uh, let that person represent them. Memphis would... Um, it would be embarrassing if they allowed Mikey Williams to play under these circumstances. And it's why my opinion on this hasn't changed at all. Uh, keep in mind, Mikey Williams still to this day has never said he didn't fire that gun, at least not publicly for the record. His attorney, to my knowledge, has never said Mikey Williams didn't fire that gun. Penny Hardaway, to my knowledge, has never said Mikey Williams didn't fire that gun. So I'm assuming that he did. And given that Memphis is one of the uh, cities in this country most devastated by gun violence, it would be shameful to bring in to this city somebody who currently has a felony gun charge still on the record for doing what it is Mikey Williams uh, allegedly did.
they should move on. He should never play for Memphis. All right. Well, we'll see if that winds up actually being the well, real quick, and then we can move on. Do you think that winds up? Go, does it go this way, or does he play for Memphis? If you had to predict, I don't think he ever plays for Memphis. Okay. I, I don't know why Memphis hasn't already cut ties. I would have a while ago because as long as he is still technically a Memphis Tiger, every headline connected to this is Memphis Tiger freshman Mikey Williams, guns, 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 guns. I don't have to remind you the NBA franchise in Memphis is dealing with a gun issue. And the city at large is, again, devastated, just ripped apart by gun violence. This ain't something else Memphis needs. And so I'm hopeful that the people in a position of power to make these types of decisions on that campus are smart enough to realize that um, Mikey Williams is a talented basketball player, but um, sometimes that that can't be the most important thing. Kansas earlier this year dismissed from its program a former McDonald's All-American who was charged with a very serious crime. Memphis now has a you know, top 50 recruit who has been convicted of a very serious crime. Um, if Kansas can move on from Arterio Morris, Memphis should uh, move on from Mikey Williams. And I suspect that that Memphis will. A couple of nights ago, Matt Norlander was inside Bo Walton Arena for Arkansas's upset of Duke. Amazing scene in Fayetteville. We'll get his thoughts on it next. But first, a word from our partners. Wake up to football highlights and news from around the world with the one and only Morning Footy Team. Rise and shine, football fans. Welcome to Morning Footy. Start your all-day football craze with Morning Footy, part of the all-new Galazzo Network. Arkansas upset Duke on Wednesday night inside Bud Walton Arena. Deadleg was there. He's now back home. Your thoughts on your first trip to Bud Walton? I got in and out of Fayetteville without food poisoning. Uh, right. when I was getting a ride, I was getting a ride. Uh, let's see. I went out to lunch and then I went back to the hotel real quick. Um, and my Lyft driver, uh, was asking where I was, I was going to do dinner. And then, um, and he, uh, he was like, oh, this place is good. He's like, I wouldn't go. It's like, ah, there's a couple places around here, actually. I think I've gotten food poisoning. I was like, what is going on here? <laughs> and I didn't like get too like I didn't I didn't indicate uh you know, I was on a podcast. I didn't get it. I was just like, hey, I, I have a buddy who came here <laughs> and he said he got food poisoning. Like, so I'm thankful. Um, after that, after the guy was like, you know, there's been a few spots here. Um, did not uh did not happen whatsoever. I want to thank, by the way, I'm going to shout him out right now. I'm going to thank Dan Shulman, who is a, a dedicated podcast listener. Uh, we met up for uh, for a quick bite there, and uh, so far as I can tell, he was also he was also spared. Uh, Mr. Shulman says hello, and uh, best. he he picked the spot um, shortly before he went to call the game. Uh, Dan Shulman was incredible. Um, one of the uh, one of the epic voices in the sport, of course, and. Um, and so, uh, thankfully, I think we were both spared. So I at least wanted to to lead on that because after your story and then after hearing my Lyft driver, I'm like, okay, now now I'm terrified. <laughs> but uh, but it went off without it without a hitch. And what an environment! I just incredible. Uh, Bud Walton Arena. First of all, is the largest crowd, twenty thousand three hundred forty four, which is more than a thousand more than the official listed capacity of the Basketball Palace of Mid America. Uh, they came out big. They came out heavy, and they were plenty, uh, plenty noisy. Did you At, call the hogs? I did not call the hogs. The, the boy, they call those hogs. They love calling hogs. They, they love calling the hogs. I think there was, I think it was, if you include the. The uh, the flooding of the floor at the end of the game when they did it again, I think there were six calling of the hogs uh, that that evening. They they kept calling them, man. And uh, whoo. Is there a the boy from the Northeast? I was, I was out of it's my a wild deal, but I, I enjoyed it, but I was out of my element. <laughs> my favorite is Dana Altman being introduced as the Arkansas coach for a minute yes. and them making him call. He ne I never seen somebody look more uncomfortable in my life than Dana Altman trying to call hogs. Straight, <laughs> my man flew straight from Omaha to Fayetteville. It's calling hogs. And he was like, I gotta, I gotta go back. To, I, I gotta go back to crazy. I can't I do this. <laughs> Uh, while while I, I how about this I'm not gonna offend the Arkansas fans here I understand how a person could find themselves in that moment and say what on earth have I done <laughs> but uh but man do they uh do they love their hogs they love they love their Razorbacks man uh, not as asking in the chat if I got to pull up from the snout 
I filed from the floor in BWA and had there been a basketball available, I was absolutely going to pull up from the snout, uh, but there was never the proper moment. Trust me. This is my, my one major regret about visiting there uh, was not getting the chance to pull up from, uh, from the snout. So that was not done. Gives me all the reason to get back to Fayetteville um, who, whose campus, by the way, in the athletic facilities, I tweeted this out uh, on Thursday. Uh, if you've never been there, I, I've just I've never been to a campus where they had it's just a it's a long 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 row from the football facilities to to track basketball softball baseball it goes for like two miles the, the actual like footprint and how they carved it into Fayetteville uh, is pretty is pretty impressive and uh, and I thought the campus was was pretty awesome as for the game and the environment and everything itself um, yeah that was one of the five best uh, environments I've ever been to that's unquestionable. In the column I wrote late on Wednesday night, or really early Thursday morning, um, I, I described how there was a sequence of events in the second half where it was a couple of Caliph battle threes. Uh, Blocker got a transition uh, bucket after. It might have been Brazil that, uh, that forced the turnover there. But each subsequent bucket, which happened over the course in real time, I want to say it was about five to six minutes of real time because we had a TV timeout in there too. Uh, everyone got the building even louder. And... Uh, they were going, they were going nuts. Um, it was Shire's and I want to get to the actual game in a second here, but, um, I was talking to Shire before the game. He had never stepped foot in an, as in an sec arena period as a human being, forget mm. playing in one or he had never been in one. So he was excited to actually experience this, uh, and damn did, they, <laughs> did they ever, um, Duke had not played. This is also in the column. Duke had not played in an sec joint since Shaq was suited up for LSU in 92. In 92, Duke was number one then. LSU was in the top 20. Duke wound up winning that game. So it had been 30-plus years since uh, since Duke had gone on the road there. Uh, one of my favorite visuals of the night was it was a whiteout. So for the most part, Arkansas fans did a good job. You saw a little bit of that, uh, of that maroon red people showing up. But um, a lot of people, and they didn't have T-shirts laid out. They had these huge Duke, beat Duke uh, rally towels. Um, and, uh, so most, most are in white. You saw it's a little bit of, of, of dotting of blue there out there. Like I, it was funny. Like I'd see one, I'd see one guy in, in blue surrounded by 150 people in white shirts. I'm like, uh, bless you. And occasionally there was a couple, but amid all this eight rows up behind the Arkansas bench is one guy dressed in all black. Nolan Richardson on the mm -hmm. just sitting there. And I thought that was, uh, I, it was, it was a great visual um, in part because of COVID. He had not gone to uh, a game at BWA since 2019. So this was his first time back. Obviously this is the 30th uh, anniversary season of him beating Duke in the title game, as we mentioned on Friday show. And they, uh, they of course announced him and, and, uh, and recognized him coming out of halftime and a loud roaring standing ovation, which was a cool moment. And then, uh, and then last thing not tied to actual gameplay was I want to say on six occasions we had Bobby chance or we want Bobby chance coming from the student section. And then sometimes those would, you know, move along to the entire arena. Uh, Bobby, Petrino, Bobby Petrino was on hand. He was in uh, a luxury box and there was no grand entrance on the motorcycle. There was no halftime introduction on the floor, which, I, I was kind of quasi rooting for it, to be honest, because I think the crowd would have lost their mind. But uh, but yeah, just uh, an incredible scene. Really, really good building. Uh, it's it, it doesn't look old. I want to be clear on this. It doesn't look old, but how it was built when it was built, um, the style in which it was built, you they won't build arenas like this anymore moving forward um, for a number of reasons. But I hope they never change this arena. I, I love the 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 way that um the lower bowl is constructed the luxury boxes are further back which doesn't make for for amazing viewing but uh man do they they, they fill that place up and they make it loud and uh it's big without feeling cavernous i think i might have mentioned that on the wednesday show so that's uh i guess that's a quick uh recap of the, of the experience there it was really really awesome um your thoughts on the actual game gp i'll uh i'll, I'll toss it back to you well i just um you know, the game's the game. Like, Duke was supposed to win, favored by four and a half points at tip, but there's nothing embarrassing or shameful about losing 
inside Bud Walton to an Eric Musselman coach team in front of 20,000 people. Um, still, undeniably, uh, there were some people who thought Duke should have been preseason number one, and now Duke is a two-loss team You know, as the calendar flips to December. Any concerns about the Blue Devils, or is it as simple as, hey, they played Arizona, Arizona might be the best team in the country, and then they played at Arkansas in front of Nolan Richardson and 20,000 other people. What are you going to do? Yeah, let's let's talk Duke, and then I got a I got a couple of uh, nuggets here on uh, on Muss and his and his hogs. Uh, no uh, big picture, like hmm, what do we see? What do we not see here from Duke? There are there are problems. Like so, Filipowski wound up having a great game, and it kind of speaks to him. He had three at the half. TJ Power had six. <laughs> Nobody had TJ Power scoring more, let alone twice as many points in the first twenty minutes of that game uh, than Kyle Filipowski, but. Tyrese Proctor has had a couple of games so far this season. His numbers overall actually reflect relatively decently well, I think, this season. But if you've watched the games and you watched him against Arizona and you saw him here against Arkansas, um, he has left you wanting And sometimes. And this is the guy who, by the way, is the most he's the most vocal guy in that locker room. And so his voice, uh, even though he's relatively young, but I mean, um, you know, it's it's not Jeremy Roach who is uh, whose voice kind of. Uh, takes over the most in in that huddle in that locker room. I'm told it is Tyrese Proctor, and he played 33 minutes. He had seven points, three rebounds, four assists, four fouls. Uh, wasn't quite as productive as, as I think they needed him to be. And some of it, of course, is Arkansas, but still, uh, really, really good players can can often overcome that. And then the young guys who are young, Shire said this afterward, they needed this. Uh, Jared McCain had five points. Caleb Foster was an entirely non-factor. He had two. Yes, you know Duke did opt to go to that press. Man, did Arkansas wilt because it went from uh, I looked at uh, I looked at the game clock. There was like three there was three minutes to go when some bodies started filtering down into the stands. And by that, I mean, students that were elsewhere uh, were repositioning themselves to storm the floor. And then with two oh nine to go, uh, it got like really like they're ready to go. Like the the top four or five stands uh, in the student section were empty because everyone was cramming down low. And then all of a sudden you got a game going from, you know, a 12 point Arkansas lead to do getting this down to what four points. Um, was it, I want to say it might've been foster that missed the three from the top of the key. Uh, if, had, if that had gone in, it would have been a one point game with like 20 seconds to go. I want to say it didn't fall. So we didn't get there. Uh, credit to Duke for never really giving up, but between Proctor foster and McCain, they just didn't, they didn't have enough there. Um, Roach wound up with 22. Filipowski had had 26 and uh, and 10. But it's a tough game in a road environment. And there's I don't think they will face a tougher environment this season. There's not a place in the ACC that matches Bud Walton Arena. Not even Carolina in the Duke game, which is a great environment. But the building is larger. Um, you do. And Carolina, there are Carolina fans who will readily admit this. Like, the it's a good environment. It doesn't match BWA. So you ready uh, for this? Yeah. Dean Smith Center, Rupp Arena. Whatever. They're both. Well, whatever. I'm not going to say. What, I'm not going to say whatever. The, but, that neither one of them are like top five. Bat. They're like I, the biggest. Yeah. Like big blue blood places that you you know they are like bucket. Like I've been to Rupp Arena. I've been to the Dean Dome. Like they're yes. places you want to go. I'm just saying once you've been in them, it's like just it just feels like a big place they play basketball. Yeah, and listen, if it's a great game, like any crowd's going to get into it. But we're talking about reg, you know, with regularity over the over a course of a given season. What are your best reasons? I've been told previously by Duke people that it's Virginia, Virginia Tech that are the two uh, the toughest environments. I was going to say Virginia when you were looking for a place yeah. comparable to like something that could match what Bud yeah. Walton was. Yeah. Virginia would have been my yeah. Opinion. The mileage may vary. I've heard from people it's either one of those two, uh, but neither one's going to match BWA. It's 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 one thing when you're playing at Cameron all the time and you got all that at your back as Duke does, it's another thing when it's right in your face, the way that it was on, uh, on, on, on Wednesday night, uh, in Fayetteville. So I, I don't have a, I don't, Duke is five and two. Uh, it, it had some early bumps last season because of injuries. This season's a little bit different. Um, and John Shire's not afraid to play on the road. This was a TV mandated thing, but he's, you know, choosing to go on the road next year in the non-con play Arizona. Um, it's a good developmental piece and they're still figuring it out. I, I did sit down with Shire a little bit, I'll have some more stuff on that as as applicable on the site later this month and can and can drop in some of that stuff too on the pod as need be. As for Arkansas, uh, I was able to I went to practice the day before and then sat down with Muss one on one and the staff after the game. Um, this was 
considered must win, uh, which I appreciate the honesty after the fact. And even and even beforehand, Arkansas knew it was staring down four and four. It had a humongous opportunity here and a loss doesn't end your season, but it significantly impairs your non-conference resume. And um, must even said it's in the column. I'm going to paraphrase it because I don't have it up right now. He told me he said uh, he basically said, listen, we knew how big this game was and it had to be a must kind of win because and then I asked him to kind of go a little deeper. Than that. He said, listen, if we lose the game and we're four and four at that point, like I'm, I'm at least questioning the confidence of my locker room and everything. We had this team, you know, in our building. It's a really good team. Playing Duke means a lot, and who knows? But it didn't. It didn't go that way. Uh, Trevin Brazil had a personal best four three pointers. He was he was really 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 good. Uh, he had eleven boards on top of that. Um, but even you know. Caleb Battle showing up the way he did. There was no Tremont Mark, which was to be expected. I mean, he didn't participate in practice the day before, but muscle when after practice, when I when I sat down with him, he said, Listen, uh, I don't think he's gonna play. Um, but if there's one guy who will shock me, uh, literally in the 11th hour, it would be him. Um, and he did share, and I put this in the column, uh, that Earlier in the week, like, like Mark went off the court with a stretcher in the Battle for Atlantis, a lower back injury, and it wasn't a muscle thing. He was said it was like it was almost it was a little bit uh, had to do with nerves. And now it's kind of he's got some tightness in his hip and a little bit of, of tenderness in his groin. So we don't know when Mark will come back because muscle said, listen, we're not chancing like it's a groin. If you really if you worsen it, then you can be out three times as long. Uh, but he said that Mark showed up on Monday in practice and no one knew he was going to do this, but. He like showed up as if it was normal practice. And by that, he uh, came in the way he always comes in. He got dressed. Uh, he got prepared as if he was going to. Knowing he he could not and would not play in practice, he was in full gear. He went, you know, stationed in, in their facility, GP. He went station to station to station to station. He did everything except physically participate. He was asking questions. His his body language and his everything about his behavior if you didn't, if you walked in and you didn't know he was hurt, you would think that he was playing in the game. And Musselman said it blew him away. He said, I've never had a player do this. He did it again at the shoot around. And he and that really set the tone for the week for Arkansas. And Mark is uh, I think is the most important presence in that locker room. Without him on the floor, he's the leading scorer. Um, they were able to to overcome it there. And I, I thought that was extremely impressive. You had some good moments from L. Ellis. Devo Davis, uh, Lane Blocker, even the young guy, he showed up well. So big time win uh, for Arkansas, and it's season to get a non-conference home win, a quad, likely a quad one win at when all is said and done on Selection Sunday. Uh, big time ups for the Hogs on a, on a big win that, oh by the way, helped uh, a seven seven split in the first year of the ACC SEC Challenge. So a kiss your sister situation in year one of that inaugural event, but uh, but big one for Arkansas, no doubt. So Arkansas over Duke was the biggest. Uh, result of the past couple of nights, but we've had some other interesting ones. A lot of them tied to the battle for Atlantis. An Arkansas team that went one and two in the Bahamas beat Duke, while a Villanova team that won the battle for Atlantis lost to St. Joe's, and a North Carolina team that lost to Villanova beat Tennessee. Is it anarchy? <laughs> <laughs> or is it, as my friend John Rostein says, just college basketball? I actually think it's anarchy. Uh, well, you and I are. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to uh, turn this into a public disagreement between me is. and Rostein. You know, it, but it, I it, actually it, believe it's anarchy. You know, it, is, it is a long-standing public disagreement between you and Rostein, and I will side with you because this 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 might well be anarchy. Okay, it's anarchy. So, let, I I did not see a second, a literal second, of the Nova St. Joe's game because of you know the the flow of the day and getting ready for the archive. I did watch Carolina, Tennessee, uh, a decent chunk of it from the media room um, uh, with Billis before that game tipped off. So I got a sense of that. Although when I started watching, so we'll get to Tennessee UNC in just a second. Um, I don't know how much you did or didn't watch of, of Nova St. Joe's, uh, but a, just a quick comment on it. Um, it's, I think Nova is unbeaten against all non big five teams, but now it's Owen two this season against uh, intra Philadelphia schools there. Um, with with a game against Drexel coming up, be careful. Not a Big Five team though, so I think they're okay, which has always been weird to me. There's there's the Big Five in Philly, and then Drexel's the sixth Division One uh, Philadelphia based uh, program. Check and this though: is Drexel a part of this now? 
Yeah, they which is long long been overdue. It's part of the uh, intra Philly basketball series that they're doing, which is part of why Nova's playing Drexel. But I, it's still not formally recognized as a Big Five school, which is weird because I think it's I think it's like not even a mile away from maybe Penn. I it's a little bit, it's a, a little bit the same way we treat Taiwan. I think. Okay. <laughs> I remember calling. I remember going to the Palestra in like 2012 for the first time and someone tell him and i was getting like a bite right right there and someone's like yeah drexel's right around the corner i think that's i think that's accurate um uh nice win for st joe's which uh, that's not a stunner in this regard st joe's almost took out a really really good kentucky team so perhaps finally gp finally we have a, a st joe's team that's actually you know relatively uh competent and competitive here they're five and two billy lang's kind of Kind of getting something together. It's year five for him, and they, they're doing okay. Nova, I mean, up and down, up and down. That went over Maryland. We'll see how that good it is. Went over Texas Tech. Well, I guess we'll see how good it is. It was a neutral floor. Um, Texas Tech got taken out 103.95 on Thursday by Butler in overtime. A score that, considering both programs, that is truly one of the more shocking scores of the entire season. Butler and Texas Tech playing to almost a combined 200 points, even with a bonus session. Uh, but Nova beat Texas Tech, and then the UNC and Memphis wins stand out big. Um, we'll see. Nova's got Drexel, as you mentioned, and then K State. Um, we'll see. It's uh, maybe it's gonna be that kind of season. I don't know. As for UNC Tennessee, um, Tennessee made it interesting. I don't know if it made it interesting. They they charged back late. I was watching a lot of that before I finally went and sat at my press seat all of maybe five minutes before uh, before tip there. I was kind of dipping in and out. Uh, good sign for Carolina is this. R.J. Davis was the leading scorer. He had 27. Baycott, of course, leading rebounder with 11. Elliot Cadeau, 10 assists for UNC. And doing this against, let me bring up the points for possession. Just kind of, Tennessee was the number one team in defensive efficiency heading into the game. Uh, to drop 100 on Tennessee is is outrageous. Yeah, so the Vols... Vol scored 1.21 processions. Man, Carolina at 1.32 parish. A very at good one point they were up 24. I mean, they, they were, they, yeah. Tennessee made it close at the end, but Carolina like blew them out for much of that game. Carolina scored 61 in the first half against Tennessee. It, Tennessee had not allowed any team to have more than 35 in a in a 20-minute session at any point this season. Carolina 61 in the first half. Um, UNC's offense is humming, man. They've gotten 50 or more in three of their past. Uh, four games and at least uh, at least one in one of the halves there. So between that, Harrison Ingram had 20. Carolina had three players with more than 20. That might be the first time since they ended uh, Kay's uh, regular season career at, at Cameron. They had four with 20 or more, which is the only time it's happened in program history. So that's good. Cadeau was the first freshman to get 10 assists in a game since Marcus Page did it uh, more than 10 years ago. Really, really good signs. And I will note this, and shouts to Steve Kirshner with uh, with UNC Athletics, who's long done an amazing job there. Um, Hubert Davis sits at 5-3 and three against top 10 opponents right now. So more work to do, but really outstanding start for him and his team. Uh, that's a big win for Tennessee. And I'll be, I'll be quick on this. Dal uh, Dalton connect having 37. Right. <laughs> it was the mo trivia time. Yep. Last time a guy had 37 or more against, against Carolina. One of one of your uh, more favorite college players of the past decade. One Played of my blue. favorite college players of the I past you, decade. I think you saw it in person. I was not there. I think you saw oh, it. Oh, Malik Monk. Correct. Monk. Monk's dropped 47. I was first. there. It was out in Las Vegas. Yes. CBS Sports Classic. Correct. In Vegas, he had 47. So uh, last time someone got at least 37 against against Carolina was Monk back in, uh, in 2016 at the CBS Sports Classic. He went down. Uh, late, which I don't think Tennessee was winning either way. Uh, but now the Vols, Vols are a weird four and three. Um, I, I don't know the last time it, that we had a team that had to play three, and this is for AP top 25 purposes, They that played in non-conference play. So not like a, you get a tough stretch in league play. In non-conference play and not, <laughs> I'm being very specific on this because some of it was MTE, some of it wasn't. The last time a power conference team played three top 20 opponents in non-con play all away from home and not at a single site. That's what Tennessee has done. It had Purdue and Kansas out in Hawaii, and then it comes back, and then a week later, it gets Carolina on the road. They're all respectable losses, um, and none of them uh, were, you know, 
were glaring and i guess i guess maybe that carolina scoring the way it was was a little was a little alarming but uh but yeah ut is, is four and three and um it'll play mason next week and then next weekend it's got a home one against illinois that it needs to take advantage of but you have the vol still ranked at four and three i wouldn't fault you if you did because of the type of losses uh but still they did lose all three they had their opportunities they didn't get any of them so if anyone wants to say let's knock them out temporarily i think that would be reasonable as well i have tennessee at 15. i i just don't i reasonable minds can disagree i just don't punish people for losing uh competitive games um to quality opponents on the road i mean i don't punish them harshly obviously i did drop tennessee from where i had tennessee but um how many teams would have a better record than the vols against the exact same schedule not many uh not many for sure and that's a that's a fair way of uh of looking at it that's almost a wins above bubble uh kind of uh, approach on it so uh that's i don't want and i don't want to harp on it too much we can we can explore it at a later date but when you really think about it Drexel is a lot like Taiwan. I got two more before we did the final four and one. Um, I don't have the audio. I don't think Nada does. We don't need the audio. But Kenny Payne said a player didn't want to play because they didn't have the right compression pants. That happened. That was that became another thing. Oh, buddy. Uh, so we are Kenny getting Payne started by saying, I shouldn't tell you. I probably shouldn't tell you this. And I was after I heard him, I was like, you definitely shouldn't have said that out loud. I think and because Payne had another quote. I was there. It was it was. Uh, it was uh, earlier this year at uh, at Empire at MSG. Uh, he had he either said it because it also went viral. It was the one where he said, um, <laughs> "The quote is accurate. The context needed more. Con- I guess you know the quote needed more context." But when he talked about uh, uh, who was he going up, he said he tricked me uh, when they used him. Woodson. He said he yes. tricked me. Yes. But you can't did- say things like. He, he, I'm getting tricked by other coaches and my players are refusing to play over tight issues because it just, um, it, it highlights that what is it highlights? Like what is going on? at Louisville? I know. I know if you watch and I was in the, so I was in the press conference when he said he tricked me. And it, when you, when you see how he says it, you're like, okay, it, it makes sense in the context of it and the tone of voice and then when you watch the video of Penny, kenny Payne, he's kind of like you know he's he's smiling he's smiling at the reporter because he's almost like you're about to eat. all right i want you to understand what i'm dealing with with some of these players kind of in like a, a light-hearted way he's like we didn't have his tights which he had brush pants tights he didn't want to play um louisville did get the win louisville uh hey kenny Payne, he's a winner he's a winner they're getting it done i just i didn't want to at least not mention it because it's one it's, it's almost an every show thing have you ever refused to do something on account of not having a personal sartorial requirement, GP? Like, I don't have this. I'm not going out to dinner. I don't have this, et cetera, et cetera. Um, have I ever like drawn a line and said, I don't have these shoes, so I cannot leave the house? No. Okay. Um, but I am very particular with um, the way clothes feel. Oh yeah, we've gone over this. And if I if something doesn't feel the right way, I can't put it. I cannot put it on. Like I, almost every golf shirt I have is the exact same shirt, just different colors, because I found a shirt that feels perfect to me, and I can't wear anything else. So like, when people are buying gifts for me, um, you know they go, oh, what are we gonna get Gary? Oh, well, I know he likes to play golf. I guess we'll get him a golf shirt. And if you buy me one, there is about a 99% chance that I will never wear it because I simply cannot put it on. So stuff like that is like, is a big deal to me. Absolutely. Yeah. That's why I asked the question. I'm all too familiar with how the clothes have to feel against your skin. So, and, 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 and mm-hmm. also things have to match. Like, like I, I go to the golf course sometimes and I'll see people and they've got on like a, a Navy shirt and black shoes. And that bothers me. You gotta let it go. I can't. Like I, I look at them and I go. I can tell you this: you're never suiting up for Kenny Payne's team. That's for sure. You got no chance. I, uh, you got no chance. I got no chance. chance. Like every if like if somebody has a hat on at a on a golf course that doesn't match the rest of their attire, shoes are the one thing I guess you can kind of get away with. But like if your hat doesn't match your shirt in some way, I get I like I wouldn't even be able to. Are you good with mine? So I'm, if you're watching, I'm rocking my big star shirt. Just to. Just the Memphis, by the way, big Memphis star. His own big star. But I got I got the yellow of the of the the Augusta National right here with the yellow and the big star. You good with this? 
I, that looks good to me. Okay. That looks good. It's a very Southern outfit. It is. It actually is a, a, a semi unintentional, but it is a, let, uh, it is let, a, a, let a man go to Fayetteville, Arkansas one time. Now he's, I go to Fayetteville. <laughs> surprised, oh surprised you're not in a Confederate flag. Okay. That, and that's enough. <laughs> one more news item. Hey, hey, how about this? I've got that same big star shirt. And uh, I was you wearing won't it wear because you don't like the way it feels. No, no, no. I do wear it because I love the way it feels. But I had to buy a. Spe- I had to pay m- where you can buy where I bought my Big Star shirt. Mm-hmm. You can get it for twenty two dollars, normal quality, or twenty nine with the softest quality that they have. And I I pay I pay the twenty nine. Uh-uh. I pay the extra for the softer quality. I love the way it feels. So I'm wearing that shirt the other day, and somebody goes, "Well, that's a um, what word did they use?" Well, that's a pretty arrogant shirt yeah. you have on. And I said, what do you what do you mean? And they said, oh, GP walking around like he's a big star. I'm like, are you being serious right now? This is a band. <laughs> I'm not walking around like I'm a big star. It's a band, dummy. Oh, uh, yes. If you're unfamiliar, by the way, kids, go find some big star. Good stuff. And, and not a deep discography. Last news item. There's going to be a John Wooden stamp available in 2024. This was announced this week by the United States Postal Service. It's a forever stamp. How much is a stamp going for these days, by the way? Got any idea? Yeah, yeah. Maybe like 34 cents or something. Yeah. I'm actually trivia time to okay. the audience. Someone inform us in the chat before we get out of here. I don't know. Uh, Postal Service says that nearly 18 million stamps featuring an original portrait of Wooden will be printed. Trivia time for real. He uh-huh. is the second college basketball coach to be fo- featured on an official United States postal stamp. Who was the first? <sighs> Two-year-old Tony Hinkle. That's well, that's that should be the answer. Yes. Now that I think about it. It should be two-year-old Tony Hinkle. <laughs> it is the man who invented the game himself, James Smith, Smith, who went 55 and 60 in nine seasons at Kansas. I will remind you, he got a stamp in 1961. Yeah, you invented the game. Imagine inventing a game and then coaching it, and people are just kicking your ass. I mean, buddy, that- I would have invented something else real quick. <laughs> that's the thing people don't talk about enough they die, and, and the guy you, that invented the game podcast. is not even a top two coach in the history of his school he's not a top five coach <laughs> he might not be a top 10 coach although kansas itself might be coach number nine they, they haven't had many he, he, it's a limited one from the press release the u.s postal services commemorative stamps are intended to celebrate the american experience and honor extraordinary and enduring contributions to american society history culture or environment individuals and subjects are proposed by the public and citizen stamp advisory committee how do i get on that reviews submissions and recommendations uh come each year for approval by the u.s postmaster general um when does mick cronin get commemorated can we get on this committee what are we doing here you could actually fit fit mick cronin on a stamp (laughs) you're insulting yourself when you say that uh but i would post mick cronin up yeah (laughs) Uh, Mick, by the way, get better. He missed uh, UCLA barely won on Thursday night. Cronin has uh, COVID. He didn't coach. Dylan Andrews had a game-winning shot for UCLA with under four seconds remaining. Uh, UCLA beat UC Irvine 66-65. Uh, congrats to John Wooden. Uh, the only thing I want to – I bring this up uh, because, one, Cronin, he can't be far. If if Wooden's going to be 2024, can we get Cronin on there by 25, 26 the latest? And so. uh, this is our plea to anyone that works for the United States Postal Service and and – can can impact this. I I just want hashtag Nell can stay. Okay. Well, like who, I need who? on the stamp. I need you can do whatever you want with Wooden. I want hashtag Nell can stay. Have that on there. Put it on the envelope. Get it done. Out of here. Wooden hashtag Nell can stay. Let's go. I mean, who has more John Wooden Coach of the Year awards, Mick Cronin or John Wooden? We already know the answer. It's not even close. It's not even close. So yeah, we'll get there someday. And I'm. Looking forward to it. Can we do the final four and one? I think it's time. All right. Let's get a word from our partners first, though. We need the sports news anywhere. We've got breaking news to bring you. Then get your sports anytime you want them. Big trade news overnight to discuss. Because we know you need sports all the time. A lot of movement in the rankings this week. A legend adds to their legacy. We're bringing you that breaking news right here on HQ. CBS Sports HQ, anywhere, anytime, all the time. Final four and one is presented by FanDuel Sportsbook. Make every moment more updated records on the season. Dead legs, seven and eight. Okay. GP, nine and six. Is that true? Feels true. Nada, can you confirm that, please? Can you turn on your mic real quick? Is that true? 
Unfortunately, it is very true. What do you mean, unfortunately? Who side you on here? There we go. That's what I like to hear. My own. (laughs) Put your ones up. Oh, no, not doing this again. (laughs) Put your ones up. Uh, Told by the chat, forever stamp, 66 to 68 cents projection for for 2024. I remember when a stamp was 10 cents. 68 cents for a stamp? What are we doing here? (sighs) What are we doing here? I know. Um... Really, that's my that's my situation right now. I'm that far behind. Yeah, you're nine and six. I've got an insurmountable lead. Tell them what game one is. Game one, Friday, nine p.m. Eastern. It's UConn at Kansas inside TJ Gasnola Fieldhouse. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. This is oh. a good one. This is a good one, boy. If there's anything to get your attention off SmackDown tonight, it's gonna be UConn at Kansas. Jayhawks minus two and a half. What a game this is. Big East Big 12 battle is why this game is happening. Uh, do I need to remind you? These are the most two recent national champions in this sport. It's the You'll fourth need to time. Remind me. Kansas 3 0 all time against UConn. Most recent matchup came in 2016 in the NCAA tournament. Um, I expect a lot of offense here. Uh, I think this game has a high percentage chance at being tremendous. And by tremendous, I mean maybe one of the Three best games we've had so far this season. You made a real mistake not going straight from Fayetteville to Lawrence. I'm gonna see UConn. I'm gonna see UConn next a couple days. Okay, okay. There's uh, again, I'm, my wife, the UConn alumnus, alumni, alumnae, I should say. Um, she found out I was going to see UConn <laughs> in the middle of the country when she knew I was seeing UConn. Again. No, you wouldn't be going to see UConn. You would be going to experience possibly the greatest non-league competition this sport will produce this season arizona duke was pretty high quality we'll see if it can beat it um i've been to fog island unfortunately if i hadn't i probably would have tried to uh, arrange that um you kind of second in the country in two point percentage by the way and yet it's 237 and three point shooting so far uh it's really 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 good at rebounding so far so that's been a big reason why it's been as good as it's been it's the only team in the country with 14.5 points or more coming from five guys on this roster UConn is putting up buckets in a big way. Meantime, Kansas leads the nation in assists per game. They're getting 24 dimes per night, and they're second in overall field goal percentage, 54% from the field, and uh, and their defense has been pretty solid as well. Seven steals, five blocks per night. Dickinson, 21.7 points per game. He leads the country in rebounding, 12.7 boards. Uh, Kevin McCuller, 18 per night. Dewan Harris, by the way, 7.4 assists per game. That's fifth in the country. This is an outstanding matchup. UConn's won 24 straight non-conference games against uh, against teams in the non-conference, of course. That's how that works, but they're all by yep. double digits. Uh, this is a humongous ass to beat Kansas by 10 or more points in Fog Allen. Coaches like to say, you go walk in down 50 nothing in this building. I'm going to go Kansas in this one. I hope it's amazing. I think it's got a really good shot at being a terrific watch. Build your Friday night around Kansas, uh, Connecticut at Kansas for the first time at Fog Allen Fieldhouse. I spot funny business here. There's some funny business going on. What do we got? How's the preseason number one team only a two and a half point favorite at home? Because Connecticut's beaten 24 straight non-conference opponents by 10 or more points. And that average, I think if you go over the course of it, I think that that average is out to something like 23 points per win. They're killing. If you're not in the Big East, you got no shot. Kansas is going to try and disprove that tonight. Every, every casual in the world is going to say this. How could you not just take Kansas at home with two and a half? Good Lord. Right? That's what you just did. I, Try to dress up like a Southerner. I, I've seen what happens in that building. I, I got to take Kansas here. I just feel like I need to... Every every Everything I know about everything tells me you got to take Kansas here. But I'm going to take UConn. I'm not going to fall victim to the funny business. Can't trick me. Okay. Independent thinker, you might remember. Yeah. You learned that from me? I don't know where I learned it. <laughs> no, you literally, it became a thing on the show because of me. Or <laughs> maybe I learned it from you. I'm taking UConn, and it goes against everything I believe in. Kansas was my preseason number one. I voted Bill Self the best coach in college basketball, and now I'm going to refuse to take them as only a two and a half point favorite at home it goes against everything i believe in you're pulling the costanza you're going with the opposite i respect it thank you 
Game two, Saturday, 7 p.m. Eastern, Colorado State at Washington inside the Tupac Grand Garden Arena. Ooh. Rest in peace, Pac. Colorado State minus five. Undefeated Rams are up to number 11 in the top 25 and one. Okay. I might need to pump fake here. I want to say you had this as a roadie in the dock. I thought this was at Washington. But this is not. This is in Vegas. You no, know, I. Uh, hey, if it's Colorado State versus Washington inside the Tupac Grand Garden Arena in Las Vegas. If I didn't make that clear, consider it clear yeah. now. I was like, and rest in peace, Pac. <laughs> I was pulling some stuff together. I was like, CSU given five in Seattle? This can't be true. Colorado State, 7-0, and coming off a win on Wednesday night against Colorado. That was a home win. Has three wins this season away from home at Northern Colorado and then beat BC and Creighton in KC in their MTE. It's been awesome. Isaiah Stevens. I don't need to keep reminding our, our audience. If you listen to the show, you're familiar, but it's not just him. Joel Scott, really, really good player for them as well. Neek Clifford, um, get in now. That being said, I'll go with Washington here. Give me uh give me Mike Hopkins team to to step up and and, and keep this one close. Five's a little too big, and they've got enough playmakers. Keon Brooks, Davia Wheeler, Paul Mulcahy is now. Washington Husky after coming over from Rutgers. Uh numbers too big. I'll go with the I'll go with UW. Picking against Nico Medved, I see. He's always been an enemy near the top of my list. Seven and oh. Blowout of Creighton. Victory over in state rival Colorado for the first time since 2017. They've started 96. Colorado State did at Ken Palm. I mean, no, uh, 74th, rather, and already up to number 23. Future Mountain West Conference champions, what do you think? Rams are my Aztecs. I'll still go SDSU as of right now, but it's uh, it's a coin flip. I'm thinking Colorado State. And Nevada yeah. fans out there are like, what are you talking about? I, I see you. Nevada. No, no, no. Nevada's strong, too. I see it. Fun league. Very fun. I, I, you said two teams go into the tournament from that league at the preseason. I told you to be more. I don't remember saying you that. did. You I, I, trust me. You did. I don't think that. I don't. Yeah. That doesn't sound like something I would say. Yeah. That doesn't sound like something I would say. I'm taking Colorado State. Rams are 11th in the top 25 and one. How could I pick against them? Game three, Saturday, 10 p.m. Eastern. It's USC Gonzaga. This is the second part of a doubleheader inside Tupac Green Garden Arena. Rest in peace, Pac. Rest in peace, big. Gonzaga minus four. Uh, give me. This was to me. This was the toughest on the board, and they're all they're, they, they, this whole setup this week. Jeez. I uh, will go with. I'll go with the Trojans here. Yeah. Again, if you missed it, this is a late tip Saturday, ten Eastern, ESPN. Um. Yeah, it's a good one, actually, to kind of cap off your evening. Uh, it's a big... What a weekend of sports we got. I'm going to set it up for just in just a second, but yes, that's right. That's right. Um, I will, yeah, I will go. Listen, I pick USC to be better than Gonzaga in the preseason. It hasn't looked that way so far this season. I'm going to say Isaiah Collier has the best game of his year so far. Him and Boogie Ellis show up big in the aforementioned Kobe Johnson who is stepping into a role and thriving, um, you know, just a, a, a really, he's more than this, but he's a good three and D college level kind of player. Uh, good on the wing really shuts it down. I think that those three show up majorly and USC gets inside that number. I'll take USC straight up. Zags. I know I'm, I'm you're opening a window for me here. You know, no, this is what you call. You're opening a throat. window. This is what you call foot on the throat. It's not. This is how you put them. You, it's, it's not it's, enough to just to take Alyssa an insurmountable special. lead. You got to destroy people. Put a foot on their throat. Crawl inside. Wait by the light of the moon. You, I'm coming to your window, GP. You ever put? You ever put your foot on somebody's throat? I no, I have not. I haven't either. I, I don't know if I believe you. No, I've never put my foot on somebody's okay. throat. But I, I'd like to. Okay. If you could put your foot on one person's throne, who would it be? 
Can we just pick the games? One person. You could put your foot on their throat. I got no desire to put my foot on anyone's throat. Nico Medved? Um, you know what? It is Nico Medved. Thank you. It's Nico Medved. Uh, thank you for reminding Why do you want to put your foot on Nico Medved's throat? <laughs> He's 7-0. He'll take the Zags. I'll take the Trojans. What's game four? Sunday, 4 p.m. Eastern. Creighton at Nebraska inside Pinnacle Bank, the most feared on campus arena in the entire country. Creighton You're not Nebraska two. fan. We're not, we're not podcasting before this one's over. Oh, I agree. We, we got to see if Creighton can walk into Pinnacle Bank. No. That's going to be tough, man. Hey, Husker... Huskers going to get some real conversation on the Sunday show if they win this. 7-0 and right now. When's the last time Nebraska started 7-0 and in a season, GP? In basketball or football? <laughs> when do we think? How about this? I don't know the answer to this, and I don't have the time to do it. The most recent Nebraska, between that, because volleyball, I'm sure, is just dominating. Um, the most recent 7-0 start for the University of Nebraska, did it come in football or men's basketball? That I don't know. I'm looking. I'm basketball. I, I have the answer here. Football. I must have been a child. I, I, Tommy I, Frazier was probably involved. I, you know what happened? I, it's probably it's Nebraska. It's probably almost certainly happened since then. Wouldn't you think? I don't know. They've been bad for a while. Well, I have six and zero. Well, I have six and zero starts. Seven and zero. It's been a, it's a, been a hot minute. But oh eight oh nine Nebraska under Doc Sadler, of course. Um, the great Doc Sadler. Started six and zero. They're seven and zero now. Eight and zero is is rarefied air here, and they get this game. We got a couple of good uh, intrastate rivalry games here. Uh, getting this one with with the Jays coming in. The Jays had little issue on Thursday night against Oklahoma State. They won seventy nine sixty five. The Jays also lost the aforementioned Colorado State Rams and Nico Medved. It's pinnacle. It just. They're gonna walk in. I don't know what to tell you. They're gonna, they're gonna get on the bus. They're gonna leave the team hotel. They're gonna have a nice pregame meal. Okay. And get on that bus. They're gonna scoot on over. They're gonna saunter off of it. And they're gonna walk right into Pinnacle Bank. Jays, baby. That's not what people do. And in a span of 10 minutes, you have picked against Dan Hurley, Nico Medved, and Pinnacle Bank. Are you trying to lose? Your podcasts could never. What are you doing? Dan Hurley never loses non-league games. You'll pick against him. Nico Medved is 7-0. and You got your foot on his throat. Nobody wins inside Pinnacle Bank. You think Creighton's going to do it somehow, even though they just lost by 40,000 to Nico Medved. I'm, I just got the, here we go. I just got the, here it is. Nebraska 7-0 for the first time since 92-93. The football team is the answer to that question. Yeah, just like I said. They won the title in 95, but they they had they had they had to have had one or two 7-0 starts in the in the aughts. So you're taking, you're taking the Cornhuskers. Yes. They're, they're the home team at Pinnacle Bank. Just give me whoever. It hasn't meant much. Hey, hey, you pick for me. I just want whoever is the home team at Pinnacle Bank. That's who I'm. I am. I'm not picking Nebraska as much as I'm picking Pinnacle Bank. <laughs> so we've both managed to insult the Nebraska fan base in the past two and a half minutes. All right, good time. Oh, I have it. I don't. Uh, you you just picked the team based on the building it resides in, and not the team itself. Yes, that's so. that's how much I think of the building, though. <laughs> Other games to watch before we get to the end one: Houston at Xavier on Friday, six thirty Eastern. Um, if Houston wins this game. I think we mentioned this in the preseason. Cougars right now, number one at Ken Palm, 7-0. Houston wins this game. Yeah, it doesn't have a, a road game until January 9. It does play AM in Houston. Not at Houston, not at its home venue at the Toyota. Hey, remind me, who did we say would be the last team to lose a game this season? Who did right. we say? Uh I, I can't remember who you said. I did pick, I picked, I think I'm a, I'm wrong. Okay. Uh, where am I? Here we go. That one's on me. I was wrong. So I had Virginia, which lost to Wisconsin, but I took Virginia thinking it would beat AM at home, which it did on Wednesday night. And then Virginia's, I said it's going to get past Memphis. Uh, so I, anyway, I'm wrong. I had, I had Virginia. I'm, I'm, st I'm going with one loss, Virginia, until like the first week of January. How about Remind that? Remind me who I had? I have no idea. I got no idea. Oh, I just popped into my head. It was the Houston Cougars. Was it? 
It was the Houston Cougars. Was it though? Oh yeah, it was. I was I, I I mostly believe you. Well, you know what? I pick Houston every year to do this. You're on you're on track. They got to get through Xavier, who's coming off a loss at home to Houston on Monday. What? Keep an eye on that. So that is yeah. <laughs> Uh, that, 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 I, sorry, did I say Houston? I meant Oakland. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the what, we got a back-to-back here? <laughs> Doing a back-to-back. Go ahead and dial back that 15-second thing on your pod. GP goes, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> They're coming. Coming off for, for those for those who insist I don't listen when Norlander talks, that was evidence that I do. Oh, man. Oh, man. Houston at Xavier, 630 Eastern, Friday night on Fox Sports 1. Keep an eye out for that one. Purdue at Northwestern on Friday. At Northwestern for your top-ranked Boilermakers. Uh, 9 Eastern on Big Ten Network. It's a pretty packed Friday. My my wife wanted to watch the, uh, the David Tennant Doctor Who uh, special that's on uh, HBO Max. And I said, listen, it's not happening Friday. We'll have to save that for Saturday. Shouts to uh, just the Doctor Who. Saturday? Five and one Memphis at six and zero Ole Miss two Eastern ESPN two, uh, certainly a good one to keep an eye out for. Duke plays at Georgia Tech, so coming off the Arkansas loss, that's a two fifteen Eastern tip. Um, that might be a streaming only situation. I don't think that's on over the air television. And then two and five and one teams on Saturday, Illinois at Rutgers four Eastern on Big Ten Network on Sunday. You've got unbeaten Clemson at Pitt two Eastern ACC Network, and then Auburn plays at Appalachian State. This is a two-for-one deal. Shouts to Dustin Kearns for helping get this done. It was scheduled uh, amidst all the COVID stuff. Um, but I was t- texting with Dustin. He said, listen, you know, Pearl is the only big six coach that, that's do, that'll that do this. He'll play a true non-con road game. Um, and frankly, like, you know, I don't know if he's, he's not the only one, but he's one of very few that would do a, do a two-for-one uh, with a road game against a mid-major of this level. So uh, Auburn at App State. Good on uh, Pearl for scheduling that one. He might not be overly enthused in the moment, but he gets it done. Here is my N1. Saturday, a huge, by the way, huge, huge college football day. Conference championship games, determining who makes the college football playoff across the board. That'll get announced Sunday, by the way. Uh, amid all of that, this is, a, this is a great sports weekend for sure. Um, amid all of that, we've got a really nice hoops tilt. 1230 Eastern on Fox Sunday. Saturday, excuse me. It goes down on Kirk Penny Court. It's Marquette, third ranked, minus one for Ken Palm at five and two Wisconsin. Now, here's the deal. On this college football note, this final weekend of, uh, I guess that's not the regular season, but you get what I'm saying. You got all these great, we're coming off like all these great rivalries in college football. You know, they got these amazing names. They've got Bedlam. You got the Iron Bowl. The Civil War, the Backyard Brawl, Farmageddon, the game, right? College football has all these great ones. And I know Marquette and Wisconsin play every year. So as I saw that you didn't pick this game for the Final Four and one, I said, well, this is a no-brainer. I'm going with this one. I was like, you know what? At these college football championship games, this has got to have a good name, right? You know what they call this thing? Um, no, you uh, don't. That's the whole point. They this call it the I-94 rivalry. What are we doing? This is the 130th all-time meeting between these schools. They have played every single year for almost 70 years and have played dating back a century. I'm throwing down the gauntlet. Can we just get a better name for Marquette versus Wisconsin? Yeah, I got one. Oh. We should Come call on, it. Man. We should call it um, Bedlam. We should, and that already exists. But uh, I don't know. But just take it. I... I well, I guess they, I guess it's up for grabs. Yeah, just take it. Just say we're we're bedlam now. You know, yeah. like that like that movie. Like I'm I'm the captain now. It's the yeah. same thing. We're okay. bedlam now. All right. Well, I was any anything other than the I ninety four rivalry. This 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 series, which Wisconsin leads it by I the way. Call it the Egg Bowl. Again, already already exists and not take going. it. Uh, call it bedlam at the Egg Bowl or the, or the or annual Marquette Wisconsin would, basketball would, game. Would, bedlam at the Egg Bowl. Geez. Can we get some sort of dairy trophy here? I don't know, call the it the Egg Bowl Bedlam or Birds Badgers Bowl, Birds Badgers Ball, Milwaukee Madison Melee. Just something other than the series deserves a proper name. You've gone this thing Bowl Bedlam. The annual Marquette Wisconsin basketball game will will forever from this date forward be called Egg Bowl Bedlam. 
It's Marquette minus. Put it on a please. shirt. <laughs> it's Marquette minus. But one make eight. the shirt soft, please. Pick Marquette. I can't pick. Cam Jones is my little homie from Memphis. You think I'd pick against him in the Cole Center? No chance. It's an interesting game. I'm Big Bull Bedlam game. Always interesting. Um, I like them. I like the uh, the Mark the Milwaukee Madison melee or something like that. But if you want it to be Bedlam, what? Uh, what who Big Bull Bedlam. Hey, oh, okay. It doesn't really roll off the tongue. It does. It's you just have an, to practice. It's an egg rolls. It doesn't really roll off the tongue. It there. just you have to practice. You have to put in the work. You have to put in the work, but eventually it'll sound I right. I learn this as a thing. Uh, I will go Marquette as well. We agree on that one. Like if, if uh, we got to, I'm going to tell Shaka in his post game, like after you win, please just, and now we'll get opening, get opening comments from Marquette coach Shaka Smart. Yeah. He says, it's just a real honor to get a victory in the Egg Bowl battle. <laughs> we know how much this game means to the state. And it's just nice to have another Egg Bowl Bedlam victory. We have won the Big East. We've won the Big East tournament. You know, I've coached in a Final Four. But I tell you, I tell you something. There ain't nothing like winning an Egg Bowl Bedlam game. I regret ever bringing it up. But we both got Marquette. Yeah, have to. Have to. That was the Final Four and One presented by FanDuel Sportsbook. Make every moment more. We ready to go? I got to go talk some more. I got a lot more yeah, talking to this. Yeah, actually, you got you actually got to leave your house. I am I, I a, a tremendous young fan of the pod did find me at uh, Bud Walton Arena, so I said give him a shout. Shouts to Storm. He and his dad came down and said Storm? hello. Storm, Storm, Storm. Dude named Storm. Got bad news for you too. What? He's like, listen, I like you a lot more than Paris. I said, I I appreciate that. Let you know. <laughs> Uh, you're you're making it worse. You're not if you're not watching, you'll have to go check YouTube there. But no, in all sincerity, Storm, thanks for coming, saying hey, appreciate you and everyone that came over and said hello and uh, in Fayetteville. My pleasure. Let's get out of here so you can go talk some more. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Terry M. F. and Teagle, Legend. Shouts to Huck, Larnell, Storm, Nico Medved. Thank you guys. Once again, for watching, listening to the yeah. Eye on College Basketball Podcast. If you're not subscribed, please go subscribe anywhere you subscribe to podcasts, including Apple and Spotify. More of us than there are of them. That needs to be reflected in the comments. And we're going to talk to you again on Sunday. Till then, take care.